Eyewitnesses describe a dark feathered bird with a hooked beak and a 15 to 25 foot wingspan. If accurate, these descriptions indicate that whatever this creature is, it is up to five times larger than the biggest indigenous bird in Illinois. But there is conclusive scientific evidence that a bird almost exactly like the one witnesses describe once existed. We have parts of the skull, we have parts of the legs, we have parts of the wing bones. It was so exceptional. In 1980, the partial skeleton of a teratorn, a giant ancient bird, was unearthed in La Pampa, Argentina. Paleontologist Kenneth Campbell, an expert on teratorns, flew to Argentina and identified the fossil. He called it Argentophis magnificens. In life, this bird would have been approximately this tall when standing on the ground. So it could have looked me right straight in the eye. Argentavis was six to eight million years old. It weighed approximately 165 pounds and boasted a wingspan of 20 to 26 feet. Their feathers would have been more like five feet long. Like the beaks of eagles, condors, and other predatory birds, the long beaks of Argentavis and other teratorns are hooked. Most likely, these monsters could swallow prey the size of a small rabbit whole. Birds that are related to teratorns are the New World vultures, such as the condor, or the turkey vulture, the black vulture. We know this because the bones are very similar uh, to one another, although they, they have their own distinctive trademarks. And yet, teratorns dwarf these birds in size. This is the humerus, which is the bone, your upper arm bone, and this is the humerus of Argentavis compared with that of a living California condor. Argentavis wasn't the only wing giant. In 1972, the fossil of a pterosaur or flying reptile was found in Texas. It was named Quetzalcoatlus, after the feathered serpent Aztec god. With a wingspan of 40 feet, it was the largest flying reptile ever found. Experts say pterosaurs went extinct more than 65 million years ago. The last pterosaur died more than 8 million years ago. But did they? Danville, Illinois, 1972. 17-year-old John Walker is hunting doves with a friend. It's a bright summer day, about noon. Suddenly, Walker is startled by a strange sound. It basically sounded as if there was an animal caught in a trap. Do you hear that? Yeah. And there was absolutely no mistaking what we saw. It was just basically soaring. It wasn't flapping its wings. Come on! If it was some small eagle or a hawk, I mean, we would not have been the least bit afraid. It was something like we'd never seen. Come on, man. The shoulder going from here down to where the tail feathers would normally be, I calculated it between five and six feet. It's gone. No one's going to believe it anyway. Walker made this drawing of the creature he observed that day. The wing was very square and uh, uh, the outer feathers of the bird at the very ends of the feathers were very scary looking as I recall. Walker describes a massive bird remarkably similar to the pteratorn. It's not with beyond the realm of possibility that some of these gigantic winged creatures may have evolved or adapted into our modern time. Cryptozoologist Ken Gerhard has researched the long history of giant bird sightings from the past and present. Gerhard has found hundreds of reports of these birds across the nation. Like Illinois and Alaska, Texas experienced a rash of sightings of giant birds in the 1970s. The peak years seem to be uh, 1976 and the latter part of 1975, where in a span of about three weeks, dozens of people here in the valley reported seeing this gigantic winged creature. 
Gearhart and other cryptozoologists believe that the sheer number of bird sightings indicate there is a modern-day species of giant bird out there. But the scientific community is not so sure. What greater cap could an ornithologist have in his career than to say, I discovered and described one of these creatures. It would be the Holy Grail, and yet it isn't happening. Dr. Pat Redding studies birds of prey, or raptors. This designation includes today's eagles, condors, and vultures. But as much as he might like to discover a living missing link between the extinct pteratorn and today's raptors, Redding is skeptical. I would need to see either a live bird in hand or the carcass of a dead bird. So far, no one has found either, despite hundreds of alleged giant bird sightings. But in 1977, a man who claimed to have seen one of these monsters also captured it on film. Could this piece of decades-old silent film be the proof that scientists like Reddick need? Lake Shelbyville, Illinois, 1977. Like others in town, John Huffer has heard about sightings of the big birds. Back in 1977, there was many, many sightings of these giant Cherokee Thunderbirds flying around central Illinois. Every newspaper, every television station was trying to get pictures of these two giant birds. Huffer is a stringer for the local CBS affiliate, so he has a camera. And because he is part Cherokee, he thinks he has a better shot than most at tracking the animal. As we came up on a bay close to the railroad bridge near Point Six on Lake Shelbyville, I looked in the back of the bay and there was a big old dead snag of a tree and there was these two huge birds at 10 o'clock in the morning roosted there. These birds were just absolutely jet black. They had huge necks, and their heads were like old cracked leather. They were clacking to each other with their beaks as they were taking off, and then they flew around and circled over us as I was shooting footage. After the birds fly off, Huffer returns to the TV station. They air his footage, and it is instantly controversial. Officials from the Department of Conservation insist that the birds on film are merely turkey vultures. But many believers dispute this, contending that this bird is far bigger than any known turkey vulture. Now, 30 years later, these scientists will review the footage and try to answer the question, is this bird the missing link to the Territorn, or something else entirely? I'm intrigued, I would have to say. I'm impressed. I, I can't explain. I have no idea what this bird actually is. In 1836, Illinois writer John Russell published a story about a horrifying winged, flesh-eating creature that terrorized for centuries the Illini tribe of Native Americans. Russell said that according to Illini legend, the monster was known as Piazza, or the bird that eats men, and that its cave on the Illinois River was littered with piles of human bones. And ever since its publication, giant birds have been reported soaring in the skies above. This footage could be proof of them. More than three decades after it was filmed, Three scientists have agreed to analyze John Huffer's film of giant birds over Lake Shelbyville. Could this image be a living pteratorn, an ancient giant bird with a wingspan up to 26 feet, long thought to be extinct? Dr. Mike Wallace at the Zoological Society of San Diego has been studying endangered California condors for over 29 years. You can see the silver lining of their, of their secondaries, the leading edge as dark as it should be. There's just no doubt it's a turkey vulture. 
Dr. David Hancock is a historian and eagle biologist at the Hancock Wildlife Research Center. There's a shot of um, a turkey vulture soaring. Now this is a different bird. This is another turkey vulture by the looks of it, but a different bird, totally different, because the, the, the wing molting is in a different stage. But Dr. Patrick Reddick, the director of the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota, is less certain. It looks very much larger than an eagle. It looks very much larger than a turkey vulture or a black vulture. Uh, I would have to say that it uh, appears to me to be on the proportions of a, um, of a condor. We have to uh, acknowledge that uh, a very large and uh, exceptionally large undescribed bird was captured on this film. Even among experts, there is no consensus. Does the truth about giant bird sightings lie somehow in how people process what they see? October 16, 2002. The skies over Manakotuk, Alaska. Southeastern Alaska has been flooded with reports of creature sightings. The press has dubbed them super-sized birds. That bird was at least uh, about 1,200 feet up in the air, and, and those ravens looked so tiny up there flying around. It. The length of a, you know, super cup, small plane. Commercial pilot John Booker has heard these reports and is skeptical. But when he looks out the window of his Cessna 207, 600 feet above the ground, he sees something he's never seen before flying alongside his plane. It caught my attention because it was quite a bit bigger than a regular eagle I've ever seen. And it wasn't the bald eagle, I know that. And I noticed the bird was bronze-colored in appearance, and he had a beak that kind of had a curve to it, kind of a hook. Booker claims the bird's wingspan was similar to a Cessna 207, approximately 14 feet. One wingtip would be out to the end of the wing, and the other wingtip would be to the root of the wing. Critics say that what Booker saw was most likely a stellar sea eagle, which can have wingspans of up to eight feet. Although indigenous to Asia, stellar eagles have been spotted in Alaska but according to Booker. It wasn't a stellar. I don't think it was a stellar. It was too big to be a stellar. Flying at an altitude of 600 feet, Booker estimates the bird he saw was 500 feet away. Just how accurate is an eyewitness judgment of size at that height and distance? And the size of an object does not only depend on the size of the image, or on the retina, but it also depends on the distance of the object from the observer and the context within which that object is viewed. Hussein Boyaja researches perspective at the University of Minnesota. So if you perceive the object to be further away from you, say 100 meters, but actually the object is just 10 meters away, you're going to think that the object is much bigger than it really is. This means that if Booker was wrong about the distance, if the bird he saw was not 500 feet away, but 100, he is likely to have overestimated its size. It also means that the scientists who reviewed the Lake Shelbyville footage could not have given an accurate assessment of the bird's size without knowing how far away it was from the camera. This effect is exaggerated if there are no visual markers to help reference the object. In case of objects in the sky, there are no uh, reference frames. There are no other objects around it against which you can try to estimate the size or distance of the object. So instead of seeing a giant bird flying at a high altitude, eyewitnesses could have seen a smaller bird flying much lower. This expert agrees. Without a reference, I don't believe an individual can judge the size of a bird flying. To test this assertion, Boyaja will work with Cliff Quinn, the American Kite Association's 2005 champion kite builder, 
for a simple experiment on perspective. There were many factors involved in the design of this particular kite. I wanted the frame to flex just as the condor's wings would flex. The bird kite will measure 24 feet wingtip to wingtip. According to Quinn, it is the world's largest bird kite. When this kite is flying up 500 feet in the air, it will, it will definitely look like a, uh, a giant condor. But getting a kite this size airborne presents several challenges. This is an extremely long span of framing and it had to be reinforced because when this bird is in flight there is a tremendous amount of wind pressure on the sail area or the wing area. Controlling the massive kite could also be a problem. Beneath the wings of this kite I have included what's called a keel. It's a place where I can attach my flying line and it also is part of the steering system. Quinn's kite and the professional flyers who will be handling it will soon be put to the test. Okay, you ready? Okay, Carla, let go. Arm out. Okay. That nose got bent back. After several attempts to get the enormous kite in the air, it is finally flying. Soaring 300 feet above a small lake. With nothing nearby as a solid reference point. Passers-by are stopped and asked if they can judge the size of the kite from wingtip to wingtip. 18 feet. That bird's at least 100 feet wide. I thought for sure that it was a very, very large eagle. I was guessing between 30 and 35 feet. And I'm going with 27 and a half feet, which I'm pretty sure is the right guess. <laughs> After polling more than a dozen people, Boyaja and Quinn have proven one thing. On this day, nobody was able to accurately judge the size of the kite. The demonstration shows that people have trouble judging size from a distance without points of reference. But what if eyewitnesses see a giant bird and visual markers they can compare it against? Mm. 1995, Brownsville, Texas, 4.30 a.m. Guadalupe Cantu is delivering newspapers. Suddenly, his brother-in-law tells him to stop. Perched on a telephone pole just off the road in front of their car, sits a giant bird. I saw really like a giant ancient vulture or eagle, some predator uh, bird. Most of it was black. It looked like, a, like it had stooped up shoulders real high. I saw it turning this way and it had a curved beak. Because the bird is sitting on the pole, Guadalupe believes he can make an approximate estimate of the creature's size. And this bird stood about eight feet tall, more or less, about one-third the size of a, of a telephone pole. They had an, an enormous wingspan, anywhere from 15 to 25 feet. Uh, you take like a condor or the eagles that you see in flight, this bird's about five times bigger than that. Guadalupe Cantu identified a bird that most closely resembles the extinct Teratorn. And if Cantu's sighting isn't easily explained away using perspective, the case of a small boy in Lawndale, Illinois, is even more perplexing. It had a 15-foot wingspan on it. I mean, it was huge. Although they can look fearsome, Native American Thunderbirds are generally considered to be benevolent spirits. Images of them have adorned everything from ceremonial clothing to grave sites. You have these Indian mounds, effigy mounds around, a lot of them are in the shape of falcons, and some people say those falcons represent the thunder beings. But the oral histories of some tribes, such as the Hichiti in modern-day Georgia and the Kwakutl in British Columbia, 
included menacing corporeal giant birds that snatched and ate humans. And native tribes in South America also spoke of giant flying man-eaters. In 1603, the Pima Indians told Spanish explorers that they had killed a giant flying monster by building a fire at the mouth of its cave and asphyxiating it inside. The bones of another giant flying monster, similarly killed, were said to have been found by General Don Hernando Cortes during the pacification of Mexico and sent to Spain. Today, known birds of prey like eagles, turkey vultures, and condors feed on the flesh of small mammals. Many of us feel that it probably Thunderbird was, was the golden eagle. It was a very, very powerful animal, and there's lots of other legends around it. Uh, possibly the, the, the California condor was the, the Thunderbird. Some of them are what we call sit and wait hunters. They'll just assume a perch on a high observatory and look for prey that is found on the ground. Others uh, will soar uh, over long distances looking for food and can, will take prey in the air. But if eyewitnesses are correct, and there are giant birds living and hunting today in North America, what is their prey of choice? Lawndale, Illinois, July 25th, 1977. I was in my backyard one day playing hide and seek with a couple friends of mine, Willie and Travis. Marlon Lowe is 10 years old and weighs about 60 pounds. Ready or not, here I come. And uh, I run around the house. Suddenly, something descends upon him from above. Something just swooped down and grabbed me. I didn't, I didn't hear it, didn't smell it, didn't see nothing coming. So I looked up and I seen a big old bird. According to Lowe, the bird uses its long curved talons to grasp the sleeves of his tank top and lift him at least a foot into the air. Marlon's mother, Ruth, sees the attack from the house. Oh, my mom, she took off at me when she seen it. She took off running at me. Marlon struggles to free himself. Already the bird has carried him a distance of nearly 40 feet. And it dropped me, and when it dropped me, I just took off running. Dad, Dad! Marlon and four other witnesses watch, stunned, as the bird flies off. Oh my God! And then uh, I flew up in this tree right here, tried to land in the tree right here, and it was too too much weight, so they took off flying on out of the tree and headed for the creek. Marlon Lowe's mother files a report with the sheriff's deputy and a county conservation officer. He tells her that her son has been attacked by a turkey vulture. Not satisfied, Ruth Lowe researches large birds at the public library and concludes that the perpetrator was similar to a California condor. But it looked kind of like a condor because it had a white ring and it was black. Marlon Lowe and his mother describe a coal black bird with a white ring around its neck, a body as big as a man's, and a wingspan of more than 15 feet in length. I'm quite skeptical about that observation. Dr. Mike Wallace at the Zoological Society of San Diego has been studying endangered California condors for over 29 years. Our condors need the mountains or steep canyons, deep canyons like in the Grand Canyon in order to create vectors, currents, uh, what we call thermals for them to ride on and to gain altitude. Out on the plains and way out in, in the heartland of, of the U.S., um, you're never going to see a condor. He is familiar with the low account. Well, it sounds like what he's describing with a white ring around his neck would not be the California condor but an Andean condor. The Andean condor is the largest known flying creature alive today. And natives of South America have long told stories of condors swooping down and snatching newborns. But while the visual identification matches, Wallace says there's a major problem with this theory. It would be, I would have to say, impossible for an Andean condor to lift something with its feet. 
uh, Andeans as well as the California condor you see behind me, they have feet much like a turkey that can't grasp or lift. The foot climbed down and Patrick Reddick of the Raptor Center says that only a raptor like a hawk or an eagle would attack with its feet. If we say, for instance, look at the bald eagle or the golden eagle, those typical birds here in North America, but most notably is that they have extremely strong feet that are uh, tipped with very long, curved, powerful talons for gripping prey. X-ray analysis of the talons of vultures and eagles reveals a huge difference in the grasping ability of each bird. In the eagle, you can appreciate the relative heft and size of these bones here and compare that to the very slender nature of the bones here on the turkey vulture. The very large talon here, the comparatively smaller claw on the end of the turkey vulture's foot. While a raptor, like an eagle, can lift its prey, that's not the same thing as lifting a 10-year-old child. For an eagle to be able to carry, say, an 8-pound cat, and that eagle would probably have to weigh on the order of 16, 18, 20 pounds. And so it would take a very large eagle, among the largest eagles that we know exist in North America, even to be able to carry a, uh, a cat. Another issue. According to these experts, it is exceptionally rare for raptors to attack humans. The only circumstance that I could imagine um, an eagle actually attacking a human being is that that eagle was raised by people. What we call imprinted on the wrong species. It's so comfortable with humans that it could be very upset. But this scientist says there is one species of raptor that has been known to attack primates. When they make a kill, the kill usually takes place very quickly. There's a very, very vicious strike that uh, the, a raptor comes down, hits the animal very suddenly, very violently. Scott McGraw is associate professor of anthropology and primatology at Ohio State University. In 1998, he traveled to Africa to the Thai rainforest of the Ivory Coast. Here he studied more than 600 bones from modern-day monkeys collected from underneath the nests of African crowned eagles. His conclusion, that these eagles prey regularly on small primates. And if that's true, it's reasonable to expect that early hominids were also pursued by large raptors three to five million years ago. With its taste for primate flesh, could the crowned eagle have been the bird that attacked Marlon Lowe? Based upon what I've heard, I know that they are capable of killing at least small humans. In recent decades, North America has been captivated and baffled by stories of giant bird sightings. But man's fascination with these creatures, whether real or mythic, is nothing new. Since ancient times, authors have written about giant birds, some of them man-eaters. Two stories and tales from the Arabian Nights relate Sinbad's encounters with the Roc, a massive bird said to be capable of carrying off elephants. Hercules tangled with and conquered man-eaters known as the Stymphalian birds. And Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's fantasy adventure novel, The Lost World. Different cultures, different eras. It suggests mankind has a common fear of things that fly. But why? Dr. Greg Bambinek is a psychiatrist and wildlife biologist. He believes that humans may be hard-coded to fear large birds because they once hunted our pre-human ancestors. Part of it is, is genetic memory or the collective unconscious that those things above us that have a large wingspan could just come from anywhere. But is there proof? One man's study in Africa may yield it. In my mind, there's no problem with some type of crowned hawk, eagle-like bird preying upon human ancestors three to five million years ago. Scott McGraw sifted through the bones of hundreds of monkeys found under the nests of African crowned eagles. In 2006, he announced his findings. 
that these eagles were regularly killing monkeys as big as 20 pounds. From that finding, he theorizes, Large, airborne, carnivorous, meat-eating birds have been a selective force in primate evolution, most likely for as long as there had been primates. As further proof, he and other scientists point to the skeleton of a very young predecessor to Homo sapiens, discovered in a lime quarry in Tong, South Africa, in 1924. Based upon what we know, the damage that they leave on the skulls of their prey today, we can use that to interpret the past, which is where this Tong child comes in. Experts noted that the Tong child, a three to four year old human ancestor known as Australopithecus africanus, had unique markings in its skull. For decades, these holes were interpreted as proof that the child was killed by a leopard or saber-toothed cat. But in January of 2006, paleoanthropologists announced that the Tong child had been killed by a single blow, a 14 centimeter long talon that pierced the brain. The evidence? Small punctures and keyhole slots inside the eye sockets had been created when the eagle used its beak to eat out the child's eyes and brain. Modern African crowned eagles are known to attack primates weighing as much as 24 pounds, at least as much as the tongue child. And markings in the eye sockets of the tongue child are identical to markings Scott McGraw found in monkey skulls he examined. These are photographs of the uh, original Tong fossil. The outline here shows the, the broken edge of the orbital floor in the Tong fossil. And this is the broken edge of the orbital floor in a monkey from the Thai forest. We know this was killed by a crowned eagle. Based upon the similarity in damage, we believe that the Tong child was killed by a, either a crowned eagle or something very similar. But do crowned eagles hunt modern man? There are reports from, from various localities in Africa that crowned eagles have preyed upon humans. Um, there are reports in East Africa. I think a seven-year-old child was nearly killed in Zambia. Uh, there is a story that a, a, a juvenile human skull was found in a nest of a crowned eagle in Zimbabwe. I believe these, these individuals were believed to have weighed something around 15 or 20 pounds. A raptor attack is a particularly gruesome way to meet one's end. A raptor comes down, hits the animal very suddenly, very violently. The uh, chest cavity and the abdominal cavity are opened up quickly and the organs are, are ripped out. And the eyes and face are, are processed as well. Could it have been an African crowned eagle that grabbed 10-year-old Marlon Lowe in 1977? And if so, how did it get from Africa to Danville, Illinois? Some Native Americans said it was a benevolent spirit. Others said it terrorized their tribes, snatching villagers and flying off with them. This man drew a picture of what he saw. This man says it was as big as a small plane. This man used a telephone pole as a size reference. And this man, Marlon Lowe, says that when he was 10 years old, a giant bird plucked him from the ground and tried to fly off with him. It had a 15 foot wingspan on it, I mean, it was huge. But the only bird of prey known to feed on human flesh is the African crowned eagle. Could this raptor have attacked Marlon Lowe in Illinois in 1977? I'm HDN meteorologist Dr. Joe Sobel. Dr. Joe Sobel is a forensic meteorologist who studies the impact of weather systems. He says birds often follow the rising currents of air just ahead of thunderstorms. Well, thunderstorms, of course, are the result of rapidly rising air currents. Birds will catch that rising current of air and travel along with the thunderstorm. Sobel thinks the Native American Thunderbird legend may have come from this behavior. 
Year after year and episode after episode, the birds would be seen flying the updrafts in front of a thunderstorm, and then following that would come the thunder and the lightning and the wind and the rain. Sobel says storms have been known to alter the flight paths of migratory birds. And although the crowned eagle is not a migratory bird, theoretically it is possible for a bird to travel long distances if caught up in a large storm. There may be another explanation for the cluster of sightings in the 1970s, an ocean atmospheric phenomenon. Now, interestingly enough, in the late 70s, in fact, in 1977, 78, there was a strong El Nino. An El Nino can cause directional changes in prevailing trade winds along with their intensity. If they were to come up from South America through Central America, could easily get diverted by this subtropical jet stream, perhaps a little farther east than they normally would. Even so, the geographic obstacles presented by a transcontinental trip make such a journey unlikely even for a powerful African crowned eagle. And according to Scott McGraw, even if that bird did manage to find itself in Illinois, it's extremely unlikely that Marlon Lowe was snatched up by one. The eagle tends to rip the, the limbs off what's left of the monkey and sort of cache pieces up in the trees and take pieces drumsticks, if you will, back to the nest, um, sort of piecemeal. So this notion of a large raptor sort of carrying an intact primate, you know, a heavy primate, back to the nest simply isn't true. According to experts, eagles can only carry about half their body weight. In order for a bird to pick up and carry a 65-pound boy, it would certainly have to be a very large bird. So we're talking uh, 150, 160 pound bird. According to Marlon Lowe's description, that is what he saw, a massive bird the size of a man with at least a 15 foot wingspan. It looked like a condor, but behaved like a raptor. But no living bird has been identified that fits this description. Is there a remote corner of the world that could harbor a giant bird with a 15 to 20 foot wingspan? And if a giant species does exist, could it remain undetected? They depend upon moving around. They depend upon being aerial. They would be seen and having to expose themselves to being seen. Otherwise, they wouldn't be a bird of prey. They have to go out and find things. In fact, previously unknown species are discovered all the time. In 2002, several new primate species were discovered in the Amazon rainforest. And in 2004, a new bird species was discovered on one of the Philippine islands. Also, experts concede that however unlikely, it is possible that a single freak aberration of a known species may exist somewhere. Every once in a while, there'll be some genetic problem, a, a mutation of some kind that will trigger something that an individual creature uh, will get huge. I mean, there are several huge people, there are several huge steers, and he, that happens on occasion. So um, giganticism among individuals is, is rare, but it does on occasion happen. So what happened to Marlon Lowe? The odds are against the existence of a previously unknown species or a single freak of nature. Instead, the most likely explanation is that Lowe was knocked off his feet by a known bird, probably a large raptor. 70 pounds is far past the carrying capacity of any North American bird. That does not mean it couldn't jump and move an object that was 40 or 50 pounds many a bird could move an object that is 40 or 50 pounds. Doesn't mean it can lift it, however. Up close, a raptor's five to seven foot wingspan combined with grabbing talons would have been powerful and frightening.
As he has for 30 years, however, Marlon Lowe insists that he was picked up and carried by a bird too big to be an eagle or a turkey vulture. Well, I'm sorry to say, it did happen to me. History proves that giant birds did live at one time. The sheer number of contemporary sightings indicates that people have seen, or believe they have seen, something ominous in the skies above. I was just happy to make it to the car safely without being attacked. I struck one for the Cherokee people, and I filmed a living legend. But I remember everything every day to the T, you know, I remember what happened to me. I had nightmares for a long time there. There are possibly hundreds of these Thunderbird sightings on record in modern times. We cannot totally ignore the possibility that they do exist. But at this time, science does not support the probability that giant birds exist in the modern world. To find a new species uh, in the, the heartland of the United States is, is pretty improbable. That would be very exciting to notice something that isn't in the, in the guidebooks. Until there is hard evidence, native storyteller Duke Attucks suggests this. So there's all kinds of stuff we believe in that doesn't have any scientific proof behind it. Uh, why not monsters? Why not thunderbirds? Why not uh, uh, the incredible?
San Luis Obispo County Shelter Animal Services Division, and we're full of animals who need your services. So we're full of animals. <laughs> full of them who need, your, who need your help. So we hope you will come down here and help us get some of these uh, dogs and cats into homes. Who you are looking at right there. Yes, we want to get right to yes, it. Right that there. Is Ivy, and I mean it when I say that is one of the sweetest little dogs I've ever met in my life. There is nothing wrong with that girl. She's sweet. She's got a little gray in her face. We think she's about eight years old. Um, just a little doll. Now that qualifies her for the senior rebate. So in addition to getting the best dog ever, you get $35 back in your pocket when you adopt Ivy, little Ivy here. You'll be so happy, both about the rebate, but mostly about the doggy, because she's a doll. And she's been oh so patient down here, she really, has. she she's has. She's been a wonderful first dog. Ivy's ID number is 199786. Poor little Crash has been with us since May 19th. That is too long for such a little cutie pie as that. He's got fabulous ears, too. Look at those ears. Um, Crash is really adorable, fabulous companion. He's showing um, his adorable side. He is showing his adorable side. He likes big dogs. He's not so crazy about little dogs, but if you've been wanting to add a smallish dog to your big dog collection, Crash would be great. Uh, but what a great friend he would be for somebody. He's a wonderful little, little companion. Crash's ID number is 199176. This handsome guy, look at that sweet looking face. That is Thor, what a great dog. Um, he was picked up as a stray on the 21st of this month um, in Morro Bay. So somebody must be looking for this great dog. Thor's ID number is 197856. Deborah, this has gotta be Brandy's lucky day. It has to be. Has to be. It's not right. This girl has been with us since April 1st. Uh, That's bad. That's bad. And she's a good dog. She's a fabulous dog. She's got half of her adoption fee because she's volunteer's pick of the month. We love her so much and think she's so great. Cannot figure out why nobody has adopted this fabulous dog. Okay, you out there, look at Brandy. Brandy, look out there. Come she's on down and get this dog. You know you want to. She's fun. She's sweet. She's smart. She's in, the, she's in our training program down here. She's great on the leash. She knows sit, stay, come. She loves the Frisbee. She is just a terrific dog. So Whoa, it sounds like she her. can show off. She's fabulous. I don't get it. Somebody come down here to adopt this wonderful dog. Brandy, volunteer's pick of the month, ID number 198354. Yay! This little girl, she is so pretty. She's got those spots look like she's part... Queensland healer or something. She's a very interesting looking dog. She's about three years old. Very nice. Um, does really well with larger dogs. Has a lot of fun down here in the play groups. Um, and she's pretty. Her name is Charlie, but she is a girl. Charlie's ID number is 181912. Oh, look at the baby there. What yeah. a cute little guy. Everyone loves a puppy. Everyone loves a puppy. He's about six months old. His name is Blue. His owners couldn't keep him. I don't know how you could give him up. Um, he is so, I don't have anything but great things to say about this sweet natured puppy. Plays with other dogs well. He knows sit. Um, he likes the water. Would be a great family companion. Blue's ID number is 198309. Come on, people. Look at that face. This dog is beautiful. Her eyes are entrancing. She is such a good dog. Her owners could no longer keep her um, because they had a change in housing and they couldn't find housing or something like that. I and don't she's know. a happy dog. Deborah, she's her happy. Smile is always on her face. Her tail is always wagging. She's no a, problem. She is a really, really good girl. Um, Bella's ID number is 195084. Very, very sweet dog. I got to tell you, we love this dog. He is easygoing, Mr. Calm, Mr. Gentle, plays great with other dogs. He is just all around fantastic. He knows sit and shake. He plays ball. He plays catch. He's just, she's just a pumpkin head's all he is. And, and what about that face? Look at the face. Oh my God. He, he looks just horrified to be here, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Just miserable. Get him out of here. Tucker's great. ID number 196283. Here is a cutie pie little dog. She's just, we think, about six months old. Her name is Kalia. And she, gosh, she, look at that face, everybody. Look at those eyes. That is a beautiful dog. Her owners moved. They couldn't keep her anymore. Um, so she's down here looking for a new home. ID number 200442. Pretty girl. Well, here's a cutie pie. We don't get a whole lot in here that looks like this guy. We think maybe he's Cairn Terrier with some Basset Hound or something. Sure is cute. With excellent ears. 
he was um, found in Cayucas on the 16th of July. So someone might be missing their very darling dog. But if they don't get down here fast, he's going to get adopted because he is cute and he's a nice dog. ID number 200384. We think he's just maybe a year, between one and two years old, this guy. Well, I guess I could pretend like I know how to pronounce his name. I think it's Rowan. Rowan? Rowan? I think it's Rowan. I don't know. But whatever it is, he's great looking, and his owners couldn't keep him anymore. So he was turned in with a difficult name to pronounce, so it's like he's got a strike against him. So people, you got to help this guy out. He's about three years old, a beautiful dog, a nice guy. He fetches, he's house trained. He's The cat, The owner said he was cat friendly, easy to walk. What a gorgeous wow. dog. No, Nothing wrong with this guy at all. Not at all, no. except possibly his name. Mm -hmm. So come down here and adopt Ruin Rowan Roan. Let's go with Rowan. 200425. Oh, look at this pretty dog. He's about five years old. I, wow, he's got beautiful, beautiful white teeth, teeth for a huh? five-year-old dog. Yes, yes, yes. I think he might be younger, frankly. Um, German Shepherd mix, great-looking dog. The owners didn't have enough time for him anymore, um, but he's a really great guy. He's house-trained. He likes to play Frisbee. All-around good dog. His name is Max, and his ID number is 925811. We are thinking we have here somebody's well-trained, wire-haired, German short hair pointer. He is a gorgeous dog. We think he's about two years old. Picked up as a stray on the 19th of July, uh, Templeton Road and El Pomar. So somebody must be missing this dog. He's wearing a camo collar that we wish had tags on it or a phone number written in Sharpie marker or something to identify this dog. Please, everybody, get some ID on your dogs. It's so easy to get them back to you if we know where to take them or we know who to call. Beautiful dog. Absolutely gorgeous. Going to get adopted fast if his owners don't get in here. ID number 200461. This is Lady. She loves, she just loves she her loves. people. She just loves. She's easy on the leash. She loves to play ball. And one of our volunteers swears she's a great jogging partner. Now, she looks a little big bone to me for that, but I also don't jog, so what do I know? She's a lovely girl, maybe five or six years old, pretty as she can be. ID number 199248. This is a relative newcomer to the shelter. Someone must be looking for this sweet little girl. Um, we think she's maybe seven years old. Her, uh, she was found in a Tascadero at Traffic Way in San Benito. So is somebody missing their very sweet, sweet little dog? Her ID number is 200462. Okay, this, this is a stunning creature. This that guy's going to get you noticed. That is a beautiful dog. Yeah, He was beautiful. found because he has excellent... Uh, you know, his palate is refined. He was at the Crack Crab in Pismo <laughs> Beach, uh -huh. and he was picked up on the 16th of July, and I find it unbelievable he had no ID on him uh. and that nobody has come looking for this dog. He is gorgeous. Just about a year old. He's young. Um, if nobody comes to pick him up in the next day, he is going to get named Deacon because we think that fits that gorgeous face. ID number 200394. This is little teeny tiny Chavo. He is really super teeny tiny. So if you like that kind of thing, he is your dog. He's a little older, about eight years old, so he is eligible for the senior rebate. He fits in the palm of your hand, as we can see. He is just dinky. <laughs> he's, a, he's a great little dog. His ID number is 199830. Teeny tiny Chavo. You are seeing Midas there with his foster parent, and she has nothing but glowing things to say about this dog. Midas is just about a year old, maybe a little over. She says he's very submissive. He plays with small dogs, big dogs, anything in between. He shares food. He shares toys. He has not shown one ounce of bad behavior, and so she is really impressed with him. And plus, you know, he is beautiful. He shines. He is That, co that coat is remarkable. Midas' ID number is 199399. Oh, this sweet little girl. She's scared down here. She's been here since the 17th of July. She was found at Oceano Beach, Strand Avenue. So somebody should be looking for this sweet dog. She's only about three years old. Pretty little thing. Sh shy, but very, very sweet. ID number 200419. This is BB. This is the kind of dog that just breaks my heart down here. She's about four years old. She looks like she's had a number of litters of puppies. 
Um, you know, somebody cropped her ears, which she did not do, had nothing to do with, but a lot of people think that makes a dog scary looking and they, they hesitate to adopt. So far, she has been a lovely, sweet, affectionate dog down here, and she deserves a decent home for the rest of her life. BB's ID number is 200235. This is a dog uh, of a breed we don't see down here very often. It's a fox terrier who used to, in the earlier days of the Westminster um, dog show, used to win them all the time. She's really nice. Her name is Macy, about four years old. She's house trained. She plays fetch and frisbee, and she is a very good girl. Her ID number is 199259. Well, this one's got the small cuteness factor going for her. She's just about a year old, found on the 18th of July in Paso Robles, Paso Robles on Honeysuckle Lane. Cute little dog. Look at that face. Her ID number is 200446. And if somebody doesn't come find her, she's going to get adopted really fast. This little girl's a little sad and scared down here, too. She's been here since the 14th of July. She was um, found in the South County. Uh, Rio Grande area. She is very sweet, only about a year and a half old. She looks like she's part dachshund and something else. Really nice girl we're calling Honey. Her ID number is 200345. This is a really nice dog. He's about three years old. Same thing happened to him. He's got his ears chopped off, and some people find that really off-putting, which isn't fair because he didn't have anything to do with it. He's been a really nice dog down here. He was found as a stray. Um, in the pomo and nobody has come to claim him so we're going to call him bosco and try to get him into a good home id number 200234 bosco little tj lost his home and he's pretty sad about it he's about four years old very nice little dog might do best in an adult um home he because he can be a little bit nervous he seems to just like things calm and quiet he's a sweetheart though we really like this dog down here ID number 920307, this is TJ. This is a pretty little boxer mix named Hennessy. She looks a little out of it because she just got spayed, so she's a little stoned right now. She's only seven months old. She's just a baby. Just a little sweetie. Look at that girl. Probably a little more active when she's, you know, totally sober. Hennessy is her name. Her ID number is 199825, and she is just a sweet, darling dog. We need some of our kind-hearted people to come down here and adopt this little girl. She's about 10 years old, we think, so she's an older Shih Tzu, just as darling and sweet as she can be. Needs a little bit of a bath and a cleanup, but she's absolutely adorable. Her ID number is 200458, and if nobody claims this girl, we're going to call her Millie. This little guy came into the shelter on the 17th of July. He was found at Walmart in Arroyo Grande. He's a gorgeous little dog, about five years old, absolutely beautiful. And I just want to say he's an example of what volunteers can do down here because he was so timid you could barely get near him and he did not have any idea what a leash was. He is now walking very nicely on the leash. He is starting to warm up and show affection to people. And that's what volunteers do in a place like this. They make dogs that seem unadoptable become very adoptable. And this little beauty certainly is. In fact, Sandy says this is our Latin lover down here, so we are going to call him Zorro. His ID number is 200416. He's an amazing dog who has made an amazing transformation since he got here. This is a very sad case. After 10 years, Bobby lost his home. So we are very sad for him in that case, but he is a marvelous dog. He is a classic, beautifully formed, full-bred Chihuahua, and just as nice a guy as he can be. His ID number is 200232. So if you're a fan of the Applehead Chihuahua, uh, Chihuahua that is exactly what we have here. And a gorgeous, gorgeous specimen he is, Bobby. Someone should be looking for this beautiful dog. Um, she was found in San Luis Obispo Meadow Park uh, on the 19th of July. She's either got it. She's got a number. Her, we know her name is Callie, so she must either be licensed or have a microchip. So someone should be looking for this beauty. Her ID number is 191631. This is a beautiful dog. His name is Steele. He's just about a year and a half old, neutered male. Came into the shelter on the 19th of July, found loose at Fair Oaks and Alder in Arroyo Grande. So someone should be looking for this dog. His ID number is 943775. 
I sure wish somebody would come down here and adopt Penelope. She has a little white around her face, but she's only a, a year or so old. She's very young, but she's just scared to death down here. She's really sweet. She's very gentle, but she just hates it down here. So someone should come get this little lap dog and make her your companion for the rest of her life. Her ID number is 200104, and she is just a super nice little dog. This is Pedro. Pedro's got a little energy. <laughs> He needs a jogging partner. Um, he's nice on the leash, though. He might look a little crazy, but he's good on the leash. His ID number is 200431. This is Pedro. Gosh, we had a lot of incoming dogs on the 18th of July. Here's or on the 19th of July. Here's another one. This little guy, um, his name is Dodger, was found uh, loose at the corner of Fair Oaks and Alder in a Royal Grande. Super nice little dog. Someone should be looking for him. His ID number is 190786. He's just a terrific little guy. Paco has that thing going too where he looks like he's an older dog, but he's only three years old. He is so nice. He was fostered for a few days, and the foster said he does not bark. He's great with other dogs, and he is just an all-around great dog. Nothing but wonderful things to say about him. His ID number is 199. 998. His name is Paco. He is a fabulous little guy who's just looking for a family to hang out with or a lap to sit on and just to be somebody's great companion. Paco. This is Timmy. He was scared to death when he got here and he's still timid but he's doing a heck of a lot better. He's a nice little dog. He's just two years old. Very small. Very sweet. His ID number is 200043, and he, somebody loves him so much they have paid half of his adoption fee. So that means that's $50 plus dollars off of his adoption fee. Saves you money and hopefully will save his life and get him out of here. This is Timmy. Here you're looking at little Rosie. She is very scared to be at this shelter. Volunteers are working on her, and she really has come around, but this is not a good place for her. Sometimes dogs do better than others here, and Rosie is not one of the ones that does well. She wants to get into a home and on your lap. That's what she's best at. Her ID number is 199874. That's little Rosie. Here's a little Geppetto. How did he get that moniker, I wonder? Does he make shoes, or does he like shoes, or I don't know. It's Geppetto. He is a great lap dog once again. He likes your attention and gives back same. He's a lover. ID number 199853. Geppetto. I think he likes himself. Okay, we're on to the cats, and this is for real. We have starting our first cat of the day is Poppy. Isn't she gorgeous? Yes, she is. She is really nicely marked. She's a gray on white, and she is ID number 200291. Poppy just so happens to be a senior cat. What does that mean to you? That means that you get $35 back on your adoption fee if you adopt Poppy. Yes, we'd like to give you a break if you adopt a senior cat. We really want to get them out of here, so we'd like to make it interesting for you to adopt them. So $35 back if you adopt Poppy or any of our seniors. Her ID number again is 200291. Pretty, pretty Poppy. Next up, we've got Smokey, and Smokey is a female. She is just about six years old, and her ID number is 200292. She has very luxurious fur, nice, long-haired, sleek black cat, Smokey. 200292. Well, here we have two cats that live in the same cage. So if you're looking for two cats to get along, we can guarantee that these two roommates really get along together and aren't they adorable? You're looking right now at Shasta. She is, uh, look at her markings, aren't they gorgeous? She is a dilute torty or calico because she's got some white. So I'm going to say, oh, but there's a torby pattern. She's all mixed up. Great, great cat. She's just about three months old, and her ID number is 200102. And her roommate is Dorian. Three months old also. He's a boy. ID number 200101. Both cats, very cute, really nicely marked, and great cats. Another set of roommates, real cutie pies. If you want to adopt two together, how about trying out Cosette and Donovan? Cosette is the uh, gray on white. No, no, sorry. Cosette is the black cat. Very friendly. 
just about two months old, ID number 200311, and Donovan just kind of resting in the back. Oh boy, here he's going to get up and say hi. Two months also, ID number 200310, adopt one or adopt both, Donovan and Cosette. Here's another set of bookend kittens. Aren't they adorable? You're looking at Dewey, the black and white tuxedo, and Blossom, the little girl, Tabby. These two are just about three months old. Blossom's number 199624 and Dewey 199623. Adopt them separately or together if you want two cats together. And by the way, if you adopt any of our pairs or any two cats together, you get $25 off the adoption fee. So consider adopting Blossom and Dewey or the other pairs you've seen. Next up, you've got, we've got Pebbles. Pebbles is just about three months old. Pebbles is a tortoise shell. That makes her female for sure. Her ID number is 199403, Pebbles. Hi, Barbie. This is Barbie. She is our volunteer pick of the month. What does that mean to you? If you fall in love with her, you get half your adoption fee rebated to you. That's great. She is only a year and a half old, and her ID number is 199885. She's a dilute calico. Barbie, 199885, volunteers pick of the month. Half the adoption fee is paid. Here we have a threesome, Binky, Toto, and Dahlia. Two boys and a girl. Dahlia is the calico. She's coming down to get with the boys. Dahlia's number is 200006. Lots of zeros for her. Toto is the orange tabby on white. Toto's number 200005. And Binky 200007, the gray and white. Adopt these separately or all together. They're just about two months old. Just kittens. Next up, we've got Mona. Mona is a nice black cat. She's just three months old. And I didn't tell you about our black cat rebate. If you adopt any of our black cats here, you have $25 back on the adoption fee. So for sure, consider Mona. ID number 200276. Here's a volunteer favorite. This is Sabina Beebe, and she really knows who she is. She can fit into any situation. She's an older cat, so she qualifies for the senior rebate, a $35 back on the adoption fee. She is a delightful cat. She would make a great companion. She loves to be on the lap. She loves to be petted. Consider Sabina BB. 199774. Here are a couple of bookends, two black cats together. Remember... You adopt two cats together, you get $25 off on the adoption fee. Here we have uh, two month olders, ID number 200026, Sherry, and 199935, Pumpkin. So we've got three here. We have Olivia, who is the tabby on white, pretty little face, 199855. We have the all blue with the blue eyes, Basil, uh, or should we pronounce that Basil? 199856 and Felicia the black and white 199854 Okie doke here we have an orange on white an unusually marked cat this cat's just about two years old ID number 200266 and her name is Star here's a beautifully marked cat this is a tabby on white but a black tabby really striking her name is Goji and her ID number is 200398 I like this cat 200398. Well, you like big tabbies like I like big tabby. Here is a big lion of a cat for you. This is Ben. He is a tabby on white. He is a senior, so he gets the uh, $35 rebate for adopting a senior. He is ID number 200367. Okay, you guys who love the exotics, come on down. We've got a silver Persian here. Look at that pretty face, if you like that kind of thing. She is female. Her name is Annie. She's just about four years old, and she's dying to get out of here. ID number 200081. So if you like a Persian, come on down here to the shelter, best pet store in the county, and get Annie out. 200081. Here's another pretty girl. This is Snowball. She's a senior. She's eligible for the senior rebate. That puts $35 back in your pocket if you adopt her. She is ID number 200122. And she is a Silpoint. She's definitely Siamese. I'm looking at snowshoes, maybe. 
ID number 200122. Snowball. Here's a handsome boy. This is Morris. He's wanting to get out of his cage. His ID number is 200420. A beautiful orange tabby. Morris. Best store, pet store in the county, you guys. I know people are interested in white cats. Here's a one with beautiful light green aisles. We call those Nile green eyes. She's just about two years old. We found this cat somewhere in the coastal area on the 21st of July. Are you missing her? If not, you can come down and she can be adopted out. ID number 200464. Another newcomer to the shelter, we found this cat in the North County, Indio Drive and Los Osos Road. This cat is male. We found him on the 16th of July. Phone, uh, ID number 200412. Here's a very pretty girl. Her name is not as pretty as she is. Her name is Spaz. She's female, just about six years old. She is a Torby on white. ID number 200397. Spaz. Here's another newcomer to the shelter. We found this cat in a Tascadero on Fresno's, Fresno area. On the 19th of July, this cat is female. Are you missing her? ID number 200459. Here's a totally handsome boy. This is Albert. Look at those eyes. He is a black cat, as you can see, so he's eligible for the black cat rebate. That's right, $25 back to you if you adopt Albert. He is just about two years old. ID number 200393. Here we have another tortie. We don't get many torties. This is unusual. We have two today for you to look at. She is eligible for the mama rebate. She had her kittens here at the shelter, and so we really want to get her out of here. So $25 back in your pocket if you adopt Lacey. She's darling, one year old, ID number 200421. Well, here's a cutie pie. We're calling her Patootie. And this cat is a Manx cat. That means she has just a stub of a tail. So you Manx lovers, Patootie could be the one for you. She is just about two years old, and her ID number is 200264. She's a Manx, Patootie. And here is your basic seal point Siamese. You fans of Siamese, this is a beautiful cat. We're calling her Sudoku. ID number 200399. Here's a cutie pie. He's just a kitten, really. His name is Freddy. ID number 200308. And we've got bunnies. Yes, we do. This is a Rhinelander bunny. Are you familiar with that? This is the first time I'm hearing that. He is so darn friendly. His name is Boomers. He is really nicely marked. If he were a cat, I'd call him kind of like a calico torty torby mix he's only five dollars that's how much bunnies cost down here isn't that great so he would make a great pet two zero zero one three nine gets you connected with boomers